So welcome to the Managing Runoff and Mart on Horse Properties webinar presented by Dr. Mariette Vandenberg, founder of MB Equine Services. My name is Bronwyn Fleming. I'm part of the Bushfire Recovery Team at Council, at Cadinia Council, which was set up immediately after the Bunyip Complex fires in March 2019. Cadinia Shire has engaged Mariette to put this webinar together to support horse property owners affected by the Bunyip Complex fires. And the seminar was made possible with support from the Victorian Government. Mary Ann Sawyer, Council's Biodiversity Officer, is also here behind the scenes and has been working alongside the Bushfire Recovery Team to assess with the Natural Environment Subcommittee and projects. Before I introduce Mariette, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. I'm currently coming, as we're all coming from different areas, I'm sure, but I'm currently coming to you from the traditional lands of the Bunurong and the Wurundjeri people and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Just a few housekeeping items. Um, this live event will be recorded and it can be viewed on Kadinia Shire's YouTube channel, Kadinia TV. And we'll also send an, um, a link in an email to all the booking holders. So um, if someone has booked you a ticket, um, they'll probably get the link and they'll need to pass it on. So maybe just remind them. Questions throughout the presentation are welcome. Um, you should have a Q&A panel on the right of your screen. At the bottom of the panel, there should be a tab with ask a question. Please press the button and enter your name in the top and the question below. These will be received by us, but may not automatically um, show up as a comment. Mary Ann's running um, the Q&A at the end of the presentation and we'll endeavour to publish as many comments and questions as she can and just moderate um, that for Mariette. So be patient. If you don't see your um, question or comment, it doesn't mean we haven't received it. Dr. Mariette Vandenberg has a passion for equine nutrition, sustainable horse property ownership and permaculture. Founder of MB Equine Services, Mariette offers specialised consulting services in integrated equine nutrition, sustainable horse property design and pasture management using regenerative permaculture principles. An accomplished researcher, Mariette completed her Bachelor of Applied Animal Science in the Netherlands before continuing her studies in New Zealand and Australia. Most recently completing her PhD in equine nutrition and foraging behaviour. Alongside her passion for equine nutrition, Mariette has, is also a certified permaculture designer and initiator of the equine permaculture movement. Mariette's knowledge and experience can support horse property owners to restore landscape fertility, decrease dependence on high cost, high input equine property management. We're really pleased to have Mariette here today to provide this presentation on runoff and mud management with her wealth of knowledge and experience. Um, so right now I'll pass over to Mariette and she'll start her presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bronwyn, and um, hi everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight on the webinar and also thanks for this amazing introduction. Um, that brings me to a much shorter one um, where I probably highlight maybe more how I integrated the uh, the um, the equine component and my my passion for taking care of the of the land, um, creating a good environment um, for horses, and ensuring that um, that all works and is in sync. And um, I initially came from a very clinical background working in um, animal science and equine science doing various studies and these studies were probably quite um, in detail so for instance in New Zealand I, I did um, study the effect of dietary transition going from pasture to grain feeding and looking at the gut health of racehorses and their onset of acidosis and laminitis. Um, 
after that, I, I be, between my PhD and my between my masters and my PhD, I um, I founded MBA Equine Services, and that initially started mainly with a uh, equine nutrition uh, focus. So doing a lot of formulations, working for um, as a consultant for feed companies. But when I was working a lot with horse owners, they always had questions about what do I do with my pasture? What um, what should I feed in addition to the pasture? And I think that really set me on a, on a whole new journey to integrate and find um, find techniques, strategies to help um, to to advise the horse owners. That was kind of working work, working with natural systems, not against them, because it seemed to me uh, not logic to not take care of gut of of um, soil microbes, a bit similar to not to take care of your gut health of, of yourself and your horse. So I had a real interest in uh, microbiology and that brought me really into soil microbiology and, and led me to um, different strategies um, and different movements. So permaculture is one, but I in integrated with a variety of others, um, holistic management, um, I was very interested in animal behavior, so I, um, I in integrate that as well um, based on some work that is done in the US on rangeland management and large, large grazing practices there. And, um, and I also have this uh, regenerative component as well. And I don't think it's, it's one is the key to it. It's all these pieces um, uh, that I kind of take things from and integrate it and try to align it with uh, the nutritional requirements of the horse, uh, the behavioral requirements of the horse. And, um, and that kind of brought me to uh, probably from a very clinical nutritional uh, background to a much more uh, consulting uh, basis on property designing and pastoral uh, management. And, I, and that is, I think, also the foundation of um, my education. So I'm really about uh, the three principles of earth care, people care and horse care. So it's about preserving ecosystems. Um, soil is very important in that, in that um, as, a, as I would say, a main focus in preserving it. And, uh, but to do so, we need to obviously um, have people. People need to be inspired, need to be willing to, to take care of, uh, of, um, of their land. Um, and the horses, obviously, so horse care is another very important component. Um, Horse-human interaction, um, the interaction of the horse within its environment, their, their needs. And, um, and these are kind of the three elements um, that really drive my, um, my, my consulting, my education. And, and this is what I bring uh, today to you, is, is trying to kind of link these, uh, these components um, and today we're going to focus on some of the issues that may happen um, when we have a lot of rain, so rain runoff, and it can create mud. So we're going to focus on uh, runoff and mud today and what kind of problems we experience on horse properties and obviously for our horses. And I want to present 10 ways in how to prevent or manage runoff and mud. And then at the end, we'll, um, we'll open the floor for some questions. Well, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to um, mud, uh, it is, it's water plus soil creates mud. And it's really the, where the, the fate of where the, where the rain at the surface determines where the water infiltrates and where the runs, uh, where the water may run off to um, from the services to rivers, uh, streams, sea. And as you can see on the picture that I'm showing here, is that there's two sides to that. So infiltration is a very important factor. So if you look on the left side, if we look at the, a, 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 a proper water cycle, is that when we have uh, rain created and that it hits this land surface, it will be taken up by obviously organic matter. So there is enough organic matter that can hold the border and then have it infiltrated into the deeper layers and ends up at groundwater. And then it, and, and then it uh, flows through to your streams, rivers and seas. But on the, um, on the right side, you will see when we have deforestation, we have compaction or erosion that we 
have a different um, a different um, infiltration. So there's only a limited infiltration and the rest is run off to, yeah, to our waterways. And this is really the problem with, um, with heavy rainfalls. If we have not a lot of vegetation um, and we have a lot of uh, deforestation, uh, we can get this um, water running off, causing major issues um, uh, large landslides as well. It can make a creek much wider and take a lot of your soil and your pasture. So the rain, the amount of rain that may fall on properties uh, and the problems that may be create, you know, that, that you may have are really dictated by the climate. So some, some areas in Australia, it's uh, much, much more of an issue. So obviously in Victoria, much larger rainfall. Um, uh, Tasmania when I was working in New Zealand was always raining um, and we also have seasonal factors so during if we look at the tropical um, area so Queensland we would have big monsoon rains um, and uh, that would cause um, a lot of flash flooding so uh, so you have to kind of take into consideration the climate the seasons and obviously the other factor that is uh, quite um, a hot topic, obviously, and very important is uh, climate change, where we see obviously the fires that we recently had and over the years um, that can cause large, uh, um, uh, large amount of vegetation to be burned. And when we then get the, the rains coming through, it will uh, it will take uh, all the sediment, it will take all the ashes and it causes uh, often a large mud situation. So it is obviously also linked to, in a way, to, to climate change. Um, and then when we go to maybe more at the soil surface, we are dealing with the soil type. So certain soil, soil types are, have um, a better infiltration. So think about uh, your sandy soils. They have typically good drainage. So in other words, the, the surface water percolates down into the earth uh, very quickly instead of sitting on top. And, um, and in comparison, if you have heavy clay, so um, very clay kind of soil types, um, they hold, hold the water and, um, and then it's not kind of percolated quite well through and uh, to the deeper layers. And it typically sits on top. So that's what we call water logging often. And water logging then leads to a lot of mud. Um, the other component, and if you have a look at the at the bottom left picture, you see a horse there in a paddock, and um, it's quite trampled. There is mud. The other problem that um, the other um, a factor that can create more problems is the the land shape. So obviously, having more undulated areas, more hills, uh, will obviously make the, the the water run faster down. And uh, yeah, we'll be pulling in the lower area. So the landscape needs to be considered as well. Vegetation, I've, I've mentioned already a few times. So uh, ground cover is very important, vegetation. If you don't have vegetation, as you can see in that picture on the left with the horse, there's not a lot of grass left. It's um, been overgrazed. And so that can cause, um, uh, you know, that's already a sign of a of uh, overgrazing leads to erosion and then when uh, you get your rain it will end up in these mud pad, mud areas uh, typically in the lower areas so ground cover is very important the other other factor that makes mud maybe a little bit more obvious is then when you have a lot of traffic so obviously horses i mean uh, if you if you don't have animals in there uh, it may stay you know they still may have mud but when you have traffic in there it can create it even um, there's even more chance to to um, to have mud. So um, there are other issues that we have to consider as well, which are uh, other water where other water may be pulled. It's not only rain, but um, we the grey water is also something that around stable areas um, that we may have to consider that can cause mud. Um, so obviously your washing base. Your, um, your you need, it would be that your your stable um, has grey water that you're not connecting and that you just you know let run out on, on around the sides of your of your of your stable um, washing machines. So a lot of people have extra you know these secondhand washing machines somewhere uh, in the in the stable and then just a pipe running on the side. Obviously those areas uh, could also have uh, you know could be a bit muddy, and 
where or everywhere where we have man-made structures, where we have surfaces um, like concrete or paths or roads, um, even um, arenas or compacted grounds, that is when we also see much more uh, problems on the edges with, uh, with mud, uh, depending a little bit on, on, on what is around it. So these are all factors that can contribute to water runoff around um, on your property and particular around uh, your high traffic areas as where you where you're um, you're spending your time with your horses. Um, mud creates a lot of problems. I think the first uh, one that people probably um, find annoying is um, obviously mud um, can cause issues like my horse's shoes fall off and I can't find them. Um, the other probably issues, um, probably more uh, more affected is the horses may develop various hoof type of problems. So sole bruising. Um, I think most people are quite aware it's been very dry, and now when the when when it gets a little bit of rain or it becomes wet, a lot of horses may get uh, sole bruising that lead, can lead to abscesses. Um, Truss, um, wide line disease, so all kinds of hoof related um, problems due to that the hoof goes from a very dry, hard kind of um, structure to a much softer structure and therefore it is more, um, more susceptible for bacteria or for, for kind of getting stone bruises and then getting uh, these um, um, bacteria and fungi entering these, uh, these areas and then causing kind of all these problems. The other probably most common one is uh, mud fever, greasy heel uh, that you can see here on the bottom right, uh, right bottom right side. Um, I think a lot of horse owners um, uh, deal with this, particularly if you have horses with um, with wide legs. Um, that is also either contributed to bacteria and fungi and um, and can be very difficult to treat, especially if you are keeping your horse in that wet environment. Also pooling of water, so letting water sit can cause a particular in summer and very hot weather um, in summers is the mosquitoes can uh, can become a problem. Mosquitoes can um, can carry uh, diseases um, that um, that can cause all kinds of um, uh, neurological problems um, and even death in horses. So um, that's also um, a one that um, they that typically happens in Queensland when there's flash flooding, we see uh, much more uh, mosquito-borne diseases in horses. Injuries, uh, obviously um, horses in mud, it can, they can slide, tendons, muscles, even fractures, obviously cuts. So these are all things that we want to, obviously we want to avoid. But we should not forget ourselves. I think that um, and, and the property and obviously the, the soil, uh, um, soil cons conservation aspect of it. So human health and safety, especially if you run an operation where you have people working for you, you have maybe a riding school, um, you can slide, you can break your leg, um, you can obviously get also all the, uh, the muscular uh, problems um, from slipping and sliding across um, paths. Um, Aesthetics of your paddock and your property. Um, typically, it will negatively impact um, when you want to sell it. Um, and it's also like you want to enjoy your property. You want to. You, often, people buy property for the view, so you don't want to look down on paddocks that are uh, like this. This one here on the on the bottom left that is just fully watered and muddy. You would like to see obviously ground cover and uh, that the horses have dry dry feet. Water quality is very important. As you saw in the first slide about water infiltration and runoff, it can cause lots of sediments. And um, as mentioned in the bushfires, you have a lot of ash sediment, a lot of pollution that can come into our waterways. And that is something we want to avoid as well. So let's talk about ways to reduce it. I think everybody agrees that we don't really like mud unless you're, unless you're a horse or a pig or pretty much any animal, they would love to roll in mud, but I don't think that it's very um, beneficial. And so ideally we want to prevent it or manage it. Or if you want to have mud, maybe you want to kind of have a little area where you allow your, obviously your pigs to, um, to go wild. So 10 ways. Um, let's start with number one. I think this one is quite 
obvious, um, rainwater collection. So in particular around stable areas, around shelters, um, that is where you would like to capture water. Not only um, water is, is, is very important, um, as, as we're quite aware we're on the driest continent in the world, we really would like to collect as much water for our own use, for our animals. And so connecting your, your stables and even your shelters, like for instance on the on the bottom right, I have here a shelter that is connected to a water tank at the back. It's all in the same color. Um, but those are really clever ways to obviously then reduce a runoff. There still may be so much water that the the that the um, that the rain tanks can't uh, can take, and so you will have a bit. You may have to consider some overflow. Um, there's many designs, and obviously it can integrate really well. You can have smaller ones, and so um, it's um, it's a very um, easy way to. Um, to already kind of contribute to reducing kind of that pooling of water around some of these major major structures. If you have to, if you're not able to collect water or you have too much water and it overflows, then there is another solution, which are what we call rain or gray water gardens. And these are basically plant ponds and swales um, that is a garden bed that you plant with special deep rooted um, species. And these plants help to rapidly take up the water into the soil and, and it allows then the, 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 the little pond to dry up. So the, the idea is, is that it doesn't hold water permanently. So it's not like um, probably like a, um, um, like a dam where you kind of could keep the water and you want to conserve the water. The idea is, is that it's only temporarily, approximately around 24 hours it holds water. And then after 24 hours, the idea is, is that it's been soaked into the deeper layers by the organic matter and into your into your deeper soil layers. Um, it's a really good, uh, good way to um, get that excess runoff from the stable. So as you can see here in the picture, um, by using a uh, in, in, uh, inlet pipe, um, it can also be a little swale, so you can either have a, a pipe running or a little swale running to to the um, to the garden, and um, you have typically also an outlet because obviously, again, if there's too much water, it may over you know it may over um, uh, the capacity of that uh, garden uh, will be too much, and then it will have to overflow. So. Typically, these are made, there's many designs and um, they're often integrated quite well in urban, in, in cities um, where you have a lot of concrete and you have all this water on this concrete and it can't, it can't go anywhere. So having green in cities is very important so that you can um, have little gardens that can take all that, uh, that storm water. And so you can see here a few examples of uh, you know, if you type, if you would Google rain gardens, um, you will typically see the the probably the urban uh, urban adaptation of that. There's many designs, um, and these are obviously uh, quite integrated with um, urban planning, but they can be reasonably simple uh, for us around horse stables. We don't necessarily need an architect to to do these. Uh, so a few simple simple um, simple uh, tools. Um, and a, a few uh, guide, guide, guidance that you need to consider when you're trying to make one, design one. So just a few ideas where you could place rain gardens is around your, um, around your washing base. So obviously if you have quite a good vegetative paddock, um, then you often necessarily don't need a rain garden, but um, if you have probably a little bit more runoff, a little bit more um, water also coming from your from your stables. You may want to kind of think uh, think about gardens or around your washing bay on corners, so around corners of your of your paddocks. So particular if it's a little bit downhill. So obviously rain gardens work best on a little slope. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, what the requirements, the guidance guidelines are for uh, for a good um, well designed swale. So uh, obviously around um, around yards, so it could be on the side of the yard, as you can see here, there's here a horse yard and um, they had a little garden on the side. Um, they can be integrated with um, paddock systems. So here you can see on the, the middle bottom picture, um, yard with, uh, with um, 
uh, where horses can go in and out, walk in and walk out shelter. And they've uh, fenced a area off where they can take excess water and um, and have it soaked into the into the soil. Uh, they can also just be uh, large areas around paddocks, so you can have them between paddocks. So where you may want to put maybe a tree uh, tree laneway, you could consider maybe integrating it um, with um, a rain garden. So a few points about designing a rain garden. So you can be, as I said, as creative with your designs. There's just a few points that you need to consider. So one is that ideally you want to have it on a, on a slope of around 2%. And that is because you want to have water flowing in and fl water flowing out, but you don't want to have it going too fast. So if you have it on a too steep angle, it will cause runoff. So it, the, the, the key is about having it on a, on a small slope. So uh, around 3%, 3% is typically a bit the same as when you're making a horse arena. You want to kind of think about where does the water go and, uh, and have a very tiny slope so that um, you're not um, having it flooding too much and that it can still go out, but not too quick. So locate your grain, rain garden where rain or uh, gray water feeds into from, from a downspout. Um, so as I said, you can either use piping, you can use uh, make a little swill, you can use little rocks. Um, so runoff enters uh, typically from the sloping ground and downspout or, or a little swill with rocks. And then it comes into a pond um, and the depth of the pond is typically around 6 to 12 inches. Um, and then you have your larger soil layer under there, which is your uh, garden soil mix depth of around 12 to 24 inches typically. And then you have your outlet going, gradually sloping out what we call the overflow. You can again use piping as, as I showed you in the um, urban in the urban examples. There's a variety where you actually it's more man-made uh, as in using a lot of piping and then piping out. Um, but you can use again um, rocks and uh, or a combination of uh, designs. It, it's a great area then to obviously plant some natives. Um, and the key there is that you make sure that the plants can handle that short, um, that short time where it's exposed to a lot of water. So it needs to be able to cope with flooding and then drying out. And I'll talk about that a little bit later when we go to the plants. Um, so one of the one of few other key points to consider when designing the rain garden, in particular around your stable area, is um, the, um, the 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 diversion drain can be built. Yeah, as I said, from different different materials, and um, the size is probably the biggest question that people ask. So how big does it need to be? And there's a few things to consider there. It's about how much is running off potentially from your from your roof or from out. Uh, if you're capturing it in your rain tank, how much uh, flows out? Again, you have to think about the uh, ability of handling that water for only 24 hours. So if if you start at a bit small and and that is typically the way to go, you can see how much rain it can how it how much rain stays in there. And if it's after 24 hours still there and it's not draining well, you may have to increase it. So it is very adaptable. So um, you can't go wrong too much with um, thinking about the, the, the size and the depth. What you do have to consider is obviously your soil type. So if you have really clay, as I mentioned, uh, the um, porosity is uh, not so good. So the water doesn't really percolate really well through it. And so you may have to um, consider uh, some additional strategies to that, and I will explain that in a few other um, a few other um, uh, techniques that we can use to manage runoff. But when it's reasonably um, when it's reasonably um, sandy, you will find that you don't need a really large one because it can take that water and it soaks it really well in. So if it's a little bit more clay, you may have to go larger and a few other. Um, strategies. So you want to test the porosity. You actually can just do that by getting a little bit of water, dig, uh, dig, a, um, dig a hole into your um, area where you may consider uh, putting the garden and just pour. So it's kind of taking the outline of, um, of like a bucket um, 
and put a bit of water in there, say half a bucket of water, and just see how easily it drains. So kind of do your own tests with a kind of a small, um, you know, small area. And that will dictate a little bit if you may have to think large or you can kind of keep it reasonably small. Um, it is a smaller garden can actually still uh, cope quite well and can still do a good job. So, so start small and then uh, go maybe larger. It could also be that you may want to have different areas so you kind of do it around your, around your yards, around the stables, and then you may do one in the paddock. Um, so you can obviously do multiple. It doesn't have to be one. So here on the picture is, um, is using a much more of a rain, um, uh, sorry, much more of a rock type of uh, a rock type of base, but you can also use um, wood chips um, or you can just have mulch. So there's different, uh, different, um, yeah, different, um, different ingredient of different types of um, of filling in the in the actual rain uh, holding area that you can um, that you can use. And it depends a little bit on on cost, what is available. Um, and um, probably also a little bit what what you prefer in the aesthetic. So, for instance, here you can see it's it's a, um, it's they use mulch. So, when it comes uh, to plant selection, uh, that's the next thing to consider. So, um, you want to kind of think about where does the water? Yeah, where do you need to kind of consider where it's the wettest, where's the driest, and kind of accordingly select plants that that can cope with those different um, different um, requirements and and can handle for instance that 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 flooding keeping their you know keeping their roots quite wet so for instance in the in the top part so when the where the water runs in that is typically the wettest area because little bit of water may run in and this only sits in that front part it may not necessarily go to the overflow part so the front um, the front so coming from the slope uh, slide slope, is where you have kind of your your, your sages, um, your reeds, um, and for instance, you have uh, yuncas, um, uh, lomandras. There's a, quite a, f a few varieties of natives that you can consider. Um, when it comes to a little bit more towards the end, to, towards the part where you have the overflow, that is where you want to kind of consider moderate to dry. So those are plants that can that that need to be able to cope with less water, um, and Melaleuca is one, uh, Kunzia is one, so there's a, quite a, a variety and um, if you want to know more about which species, I highly recommend to talk with your land care organizations um, they, and catchment organizations. They often have some specialists there that can help you with some selections and also nurseries um, may be very, um, uh, are also familiar with which, which species um, may be very good for, for rain gardens. Um, Obviously, um, you need to think about the management of that garden. So once you have installed it, you want to obviously um, you have to kind of you have to kind of take care of it. You have to water it uh, probably um, depending on obviously how much rain throughout the period uh, that you have in, um, installed it. Um, you want to kind of um, you may have to add mulch to it, you may have to add wood chips to it. Uh, you may have to weed it regularly. Um, also, when it's too much rain coming in, you may want to consider just at the at the um, at the lower part, the the out where the outlet is, to maybe uh, dig a little bit of a trench so that a, that it could flow over. Particularly when you have young plants, um, even if they're you know water loving, they could um, they they typically can't handle a lot of water when they're um, when they're very young. They have to kind of mature to be able to cope with that water. So in the beginning, you may have to open it up a little bit so that it's um, so that the it, it, the water doesn't stay there in too long and uh, and 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 takes you know and, and all your young plants uh, drown. Um, you can consider decorative rocks, uh, as I said, um, particular when you have maybe very heavy rainfall or it's, if you found it that the slope is slightly bigger and like a little bit in, more increased than that two to three percent. So you may want to kind of consider at the at the Baramstein side um, a little bit more uh, large rocks, lock, rock areas. Um, and uh, again, uh, just as, as a summary, think about the plant species having both a mixture of those that are tolerant um, for um, wet uh, conditions and dry conditions.
the third suggestion for how we could um, some strategies on how we could manage runoff is kind of uh, building on what we already what we already talked about in the rain garden. And that is if you're not necessarily straight away want to kind of consider rain garden, but you're interested in obviously uh, vegetation replanting, you could just create just a, a garden. Um, so just around the stables, um, around along alongside roads, that's typically where we have um, runoff, uh, renas um, and the water and the washing bay. So these are um, these are just any any vegetation, anything that can um, yeah that has root organic matter that can take up all the runoff, uh, particular on uh, on surfaces. So you can see on all these pictures, all of these have either paving or gravel, and as you will have with lots of rainfall, that will just funnel it. And if you don't have any vegetation, it just kind of accelerates and takes down, you know, takes a lot of this material um, away and causes also road erosion, means that you have to invest in redoing your road. So these are things you want to obviously avoid. And also again for the aesthetic of the um, of, of the property. And you can integrate this quite well with hedgerows um, and then you can plant obviously uh, uh, edible, edible species, herbs, um, for human use, for uh, for animal use, so you can be very creative, integrated, and at the same time um, tick, tackle reducing or trying to prevent um, runoff on your on your property and around your uh, building areas. Coming back to the the swale con of the sorry the rain garden concept and integrates quite well is the concept of swales. It's 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 um, if you look up on swales. Um, it is not the same as contour banks. So contour banks are actually redirecting the water slightly off contour and drain it to a central point uh, to slow water and then stop erosion. And whether swales are very different, swales are on, are on contour, are level and on contour from start to finish. So what that means is that we do not want to have it actually running off. We actually want to have it level sitting in um, in this trench and then again a bit similar to the rain garden have the same concept of that the water then gets infiltrated percolates to the deeper soil layers and then is taken up uh, into um, in our groundwater systems then to our uh, waterways and you can actually really well integrate rain gardens and swales so it's probably the next step um, but swales on its own, you can uh, can be as large and as small again um, as um, and 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 may uh, can be done by hand, but could also be done by machinery and um, is is a reasonably similar concept to the to the rain gun. So again, you will have uh, a bit of a slope, so you will have obviously water running um, running off, and the idea is is that you have a trench from on contour from from start to finish. And then you have again a uh, elevated area at the end so that again the water kind of sits and then is held and anything that is too much will just flow over. It is very important that um, that on these um, on these um, uh, berms that you have vegetation because otherwise it may cause again um, erosion because the water rushes over it and kind of takes every time a little bit um, soil away. So it is very important that on that rounded mouth shape that you integrate your cover crops and um, grass and obviously you can integrate it with trees, also reeds, all kind of the same species that we just considered for uh, for the rain garden can also be integrated with the swill, but you can even use the swill as on contour tree planting. So you can kind of put your pioneer species um, once you stabilize it, you can actually put your pioneer uh, species of trees in there, which I kind of show here on the on the top right picture. Um, it's very important, and we'll get to this as well, is that you on these uh, on these areas like your swales, uh, so on your rain gardens, your swales, that you fence it off so that horses don't go in there and um, and and wreck the 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 uh, the mound or the the level and um, and all the 
hard effort and the plants that you put in there that they take them out by trampling and obviously eating them. So fencing is a very important, um, uh, very important when you think also about uh, you know making sure that these strategies that you put in place that they actually um, stay functioning and that they're not not destroyed. So here on the picture um, on the below uh, right picture, you can see how a swill goes from on contour and uh, stays level and how that water comes into that um, into that flat part and then goes out. So typically we say there is a, a, um, a little slope from around eight, 800 millimeters. Then your flat part, which is where the water sits, is around a meter. And then the mount is again around 800 millimeters. So you're looking at around two and a half to max three meters that you are creating a um, a, a, a on contour um, kind of rain garden. And these, as I said, can um, can even be a bit smaller, so they don't necessarily have to go around the whole pasture. They can even be as small as uh, a few meters that kind of are alongside a road or on contour or they're um, on a, a, an area where you have maybe a yard which is on contour. So you have to kind of work with um, the lay of your land and, um, and identify your contours to make sure that you can place this um, level. And, and yeah, it's again as creative as, as, this, as, the, as the rain garden. Fencing um, is very important aspect of uh, making sure that we reduce um, reduce a uh, reduce mud and runoff. Um, one of the problems that we what, what what I face with is that a lot of horse owners love to have their horses going to the dam, having a swim, and and that that is great. But if you have them going always on a regular basis, particularly if you just have them in one paddock and they there's no rotation and they're just there all the time. They can cause significant erosion for your dam. They can affect the water quality. It creates mud. Um, and um, the, if, if you would if you would Google dam plus horse, um, there will be a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of photos of um, of um, emergency services trying to pull horses out of dams. So there is also obviously a, a safety issue there. So ideally, what we want is to uh, consider fencing all our waterways um, and um, you can still have gates so you can still have access to them and but you may do it on a very controlled basis so when it's dry not when it's during the wettest part you may open it up and have your let your horses have a swim so you can still have both it's just managing making sure that um, that you um, reduce that ero uh, reduce erosion and therefore then lead to to runoff because as we already mentioned so if we look at our waterway so if you have a creek or river, when we have a system where there is, a, there is vegetation, so you have a buffer um, and that is fenced off, you will, you will have better infiltration, you will have less runoff. But if you look at the other side of the, of the diagram, where there is deforestation, where there is uh, no buffer and there is animals going in and out, you will see that you get big, um, big problems with um, large parts of um, soil being taken, which makes, which also then reduces your pasture area. So you want to really avoid these eroded riverbanks and then loss of, you know, of obviously of grazing, grazing land and habitat. So you, you really want to, um, in your plan of runoff and managing, um, uh, ensuring that vegetation can grow is, is fencing. And a lot of land care organizations um, actually provide funding and a lot of workshops around riparian area management. So six, so brings me to soil management. And I think soil management is such a big topic. All I want to kind of focus on is that the biggest problem when it comes to, um, to particular to runoff and mud, the, those are just symptoms of, those are just symptoms of a bigger problem. And the, the main problem that we're dealing with is compaction. If you don't tackle the problem compaction, you will not really get on top of runoff and er erosion because compaction is, is uh, causing this infiltration um, 
less infiltration or even non-existing infiltration, and that then leads to waterlogging. So compaction or decompacting soils is very important. And as you can see on this diagram, we have a lot of factors that forces that can compress our soil. So horse, eh, horses, animals, livestock, if they're in a continuous set grazing situation, large machinery, obviously driving continuously on your on your on your pastures will also cause these um, compaction zones and that can can go to um, to to a, um, a degree where you have no roots can grow in there or only very pioneer species will grow in there. So you will see that weeds typically only grow in these type of conditions. You can see that the grasses struggle. They, they, their root system is much finer. They don't have the big tap roots. And so you will get weeds, uh, you get water logging. So you get typically more problems. It's not only mud that you're dealing with, you have other issues typically as well. Um, with you know if you have some some compaction on your on your land so decompacting and taking care of your soil is very important there are different strategies uh, um, and um, using for instance a a deep ripping or a aerating approach would probably be necessary if, the, if it's quite severe if you have ongoing problems with water if you have ongoing problems with weeds it is just too difficult to have that naturally, you know, like na nature take over. Um, and you may have to really use these uh, machinery to, you know, kind of fast track. If it's not too bad, then by using weeds, as I said, weeds are very important in decompacting our soils um, because they have deep tap roots and they can get to the deeper layers and can still obtain water. But what happens is if, if you slash weeds, so if you have a whole paddock with weeds, it's actually not bad. It's just you need to do some work on it by slashing it. Let the roots die off. Let all the organic matter, all the mulch come back to the, to the ground and create more, better, richer soil and create and build that top layer again to say 25 centimeters so that you can have your, your favorable pasture species growing in there. Because weeds don't grow in, in soils that have the right consistency, right organic matter and nutrients because they don't do well in very rich soils. Then mulching, uh, obviously mulching uh, in combination with slashing weeds, but also just if you have really bold areas. So for instance, your corners are always the areas where horses can pack. You can just add mulch. It can be your old hay. It could be straw. Um, just be very cautious that if somebody is offering you large, large bales, just make sure that it's not contaminated with any of your weed species or grasses that you don't want to have. So that makes it a little bit tricky because then you still have to invest in some reasonably good hay um, uh, to, to get the mulch. But it is very important to avoid other problems um, maybe emerging in the, in, in the initial stage. Obviously, sowing pastures in, uh, around that time when you're mulching is, um, is an option. With some composting, some you need to add some um, additional nutrients. So it can be either compost, so manure, composting in manure, um, composting, composting or, or other organic weight like your households, um, food scraps, your straw, your, your leftovers. That can all be going on a compost pile and then um, either do passive or active composting. You can then get it to a stage where you can then return it to your pastures. Um, or you may want to use some other um, other products uh, or um, like liquid fertilizers. Um, you may want to even go into compost teas. There is a large variety of, of products that, that can help with conditioning the soil. I'm talking not about, um, about fertilizers, I'm talking particularly about soil conditioners. And these are like your kind of the Yakults of uh, for for uh, for the soil, I already highlighted. I have a big passion about creating um, a good health in the gut of the horse, and in, and it's very important to have that also in the soil. And so having mm, products that can um, help as a kind of like a prebiotic uh, or a probiotic, where you actually add um, life or uh, live organisms to your soil can really help with speeding up all of the processes that I said above. It can help with decompacting. It can help with 
um, soil development, so creating, you know, kind of fast tracking the decaying process. And that can have some really positive effects on then creating a good medium for having grasses grow again. The other component then if you have grass, so once you have grass or even if you're not having grass and you need to do some management on it, you need to be able to lock your horses. Uh, you need to be able to lock your horses up in certain areas and have them um, and have the uh, areas that you want to work on or that you need to rest or recover available so that there's not a, this ongoing grazing. And this ties in with um, grazing planning. So the seventh strategy that you need to adopt to reduce like runoff and take care of your of your pasture is um, for to avoid that trampling is uh, grazing planning. So that is typically we talk here about rotational grazing, but there are a variety of um, of uh, additional uh, what we call advanced cell grazing or laneway um, laneway grazing or strip grazing that you may consider. But all of them, it's all about the time. So particular over trampling and over grazing is not related to the amount of animals that are in that area. It is really uh, related to the times they spend and have contact with the soil. Um, so you want to make sure that you manage that time. And that is where rotational grazing or the cell grazing is very important to or strip grazing to be um, moving animals along to another area and avoid that uh, contact that they can overgraze that that leads then to grasses not being able to establish again and um, and then obviously uh, you will have um, exposed soils we, we then get rain we know we get mud so we want to avoid that so grazing management is very important and Typically, we don't want to graze pastures, say, below four centimeters on temperate grasses and don't want to see grass below 10 centimeters in tropical systems. That's typically the rule. If you don't have the ability to have so many paddocks to be able to rotate horses around and make subdivisions, you may have to consider some additional strategies and it is because Sometimes you have quite a bit of land, but then your horse is maybe so far away. And if you're having a busy life and you want to go for a quick ride, it's maybe not always um, always useful to have horses very far in very far paddocks. Um, so I think often horse owners like, even if they have this space and even if they have the land, they still want to have the horses quite close to their to around their uh, shelters and um, stay of the, around the stable block, around the arena area. And so this is where sacrifice and central point designs can come in. So I show here uh, two examples of that, where it's either um, uh, an area, a separate area that then connects to paddocks, or it can be that it's uh, connected to stables and then connected to, to paddocks, and, and you can incorporate laneway systems even. And the main purpose of this is a to be able to lock up your horses in areas so that you have those paddocks available for development, for resting. Um, it can also be you dealing obviously when it's really wet, your horses have uh, feed problems. You want to kind of have an area where you can um, have their uh, where they can have their feed dry. And um, that's where these uh, central point systems uh, come real in handy when you combine it with a special footing. Um, it also is a good strategy for those people that have horses that uh, particular now where it's so green and we have so much uh, horses that have uh, metabolic uh, disorders are getting too, you know, too fat, um, have laminitis. You may have to adopt these strategies even if you have all the paddocks reasonably in good shape you may even want to consider having horses in these areas so not only for much management but it integrates it quite well you can also then use these slow feeding systems so you can see here in that bottom uh, photo they have like a central uh, feeding uh, area where they um, they you know feed hay where horses in a group can um, can um, have access at lip so you can lock up your horse, but make sure that you understand that horses are designed to almost eat on a continuous basis um, a forage. 
And so we do need to then, if you uh, if we don't have that pasture access, to still have this stimulation and still have um, roughage to obviously support gut health. As I mentioned, the 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 um, the sacrificed central point areas are not really successful unless you do it with footing. So they go hand in hand. So these are typically, it can be quite a variety of, um, of materials. And the design is a little bit along the same, um, a same concept like an arena. You want to have a little bit of a a slope, say one to two percent. So again, that two percent is typically always a sweet spot with a lot of things that we want to design where there is water. Um, you want to kind of think about uh, your obviously your sub base and that needs to be in one to two percent. You want to think about um, a base that can have the water um, so you know soaking in and then um, taking taking um, taking up and then draining away through to the lower end, obviously, where you ideally want to have to consider again like a vegetative buffer. And then on top, that is where your footing sits. And there's a variety that you can uh, that you can use. I, again, obviously, you have to consider your your fence and you need to think about like a um, like a uh, cladding or like a kickboard, because otherwise, um, if it's really heavy rain, you may have all this beautiful footing and some of this footing can be quite expensive washing out a bit similar along the same lines as an arena. So things that you can use are sand, um, probably the most easiest available, um, but you can also think about wood chips. Um, they are more of an, of course, wood chips are an organic, uh, an organic material and over time, depending in what kind of climate it is, you may have to add to it. So as you know, wood chips will decompose, so fungi will break it down. And it will take a long process and typically it takes quite a bit. But if you're in a right environment, um, like uh, for instance, like in the Netherlands or in um, England or in New Zealand, you will find that the decay process is quite quick. And so each year you may have to add to it. So it can be maybe not a good consideration if it's very, um, very um, um, kind of wet throughout the year. If um, if you have the opportunity to use like a P rock, most people that are um, having horses with feet problems, uh, laminitis, they typically prefer these kind of small pebbles that you can see here in the top corner. Um, tip, horses really seem to uh, enjoy it. It's it's a small kind of uh, rock. Um, uh, it's round and it kind of creates a nice kind of area where they can actually move their feet in and, and, and kind of dictate a little bit the angle that they want to have. Um, they, it is a bit more expensive here in, in Australia, so uh, it's, it's a bit harder to get because it needs to be, you know, gravel is not so hard to get, but it's this really nice rounded rock that is um, quite hard to get here in Australia. Um, so it may be a bit of an investment and it may also be uh, not an easy one to get, but it's very common uh, in, uh, in, um, in America. The other one that is getting a lot of traction is, um, is geohex, uh, geohex type of products. Um, so it's kind of like a, a plastic paver or a, uh, a grid. So it's either a plastic paver, a tile, or a mat um, that have kind of honeycomb structures, or you can see here like little squares. So they come in all kinds of shapes and, and different material. They are from plastic, so um, and they have to be laid down as the base. And then on in those in those pockets, you then fill it with sand or with um, with uh, pea rock, for instance. So it still needs a bit of a footing. So you don't have um, horses typically on top of it. Um, there's a few that can have it. It depends a little bit on the quality and the and the and the um, the um, the amount of uh, polyester they have in there, because uh, these this one here in the photo is 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 much more holding it so that you um, have your footing in it. The, some of them. Um, you can actually have the horses straight on it. But typically you want to have it in combination um, because when the water then comes in, it's because it has a grid system, 
the water doesn't um, kind of flow over. It kind of sits in the little pockets and then is taken to to your base and then and taken then off to your uh, fed, you know, your lower end to hope, oh, ideally either a, a pasture paddock or a, a, again a garden or a vegetative buffer. So these um, these can be uh, a little bit of an investment. So again, uh, it could be a small area that you're looking at. So it can be around um, uh, around uh, going from uh, from the stable to paddocks or between paddocks. So it could be that you use that for laneway systems. They're often used around um, water um, water points, gateways. Um, uh, as you can see here, around feeding areas, um, central point areas where horses can feed. Um, so again, the, the price will differ. There's a quite of a few varieties out there. Um, again, it's a bit of an investment, so it's something that you may want to uh, consider for a smaller space or you want to um, start small and then you may want to progress and actually have it throughout uh, towards your um, laneway and then maybe in the uh, gateways of your of your paddock. Again, footing can also be considered around those areas. Um, you can, for instance, without the, the like this erosion control material, but often you find that after a while, if you don't have it um, with this kind of erosion control, you will find that around the gateways, you will have to redo it every so often. So again, um, the investment is worthwhile because it will prevent you from, you know, over every time putting more uh, more materials footing uh, in those uh, high traffic areas. Again, these kind of central point systems don't work, even if you have your geohex material, um, they, they, they don't work if you just kind of have the manure just eat, sitting on there. So it is very important to do proper um, manure management. So um, you want to keep those areas clean. Uh, also in paddocks, you know, you don't want to have it building up. So you want to kind of think about um, collecting it. Ideally, um, a lot of people like to sell it because um, they can get a few bucks for it. But the best strategy would be to compost it and then use it to build soils and, and return it to your pasture. Or you can consider harrowing it um, during your during the wet, you know, around the rains, making sure that you take the horses out of those paddocks and let you know nature um, uh, de uh, have the process of decaying uh, uh, decaying the material before you return uh, your horses also from a parasite point of view so you don't want to have that uh, during the dry period when it's when it's hot and there is no water then the manure just sits on top and it's not taken into into your um, into your soil and broken down by uh, organisms so you really need to think about when to do your harrowing and in this in the same way, composting, ideally you want to do it around the rain, but it's much safer to return horses if you've done good composting because all the um, all the nematodes and um, kind of your your organisms that you uh, parasiticides, they are typically broken down by um, by the heat of the composting process. But it has to be done correctly because otherwise you may actually get breed um, anaerobic bacteria that um, are not uh, not so good and that uh, and then you spread that on your on your paddock. So composting is um, a next step. If you're really interested in ticking a few boxes, it is really worthwhile and you don't necessarily need to spend a lot of time with it. There are a few techniques um, using uh, uh, passive composting strategies with um, um, with piping for aeration. And that brings me, um, <coughs> pardon me, to the end. <coughs> Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Sorry, Marianne, you're on mute. Sorry, everyone. Um, 
I get caught out all the time with that mute button. Um, I just wanted to thank Mariette for her presentation. Um, as a horse owner myself, um, <clears throat> I certainly, we certainly come across the issues that Mariette's talking about. So it was really great to hear some of her um, remedies um, along the lines of soil conservation and um, swales, etc. Um, we now have time for a 10 to 15 minute question and answer. We've got um, a couple of questions on the, um, the question and answer panel that we can go to. Thanks for submitting your questions during the presentation. Feel free to um, add some more questions to that because I think we've got time for a few more than are up there. So um, I'll throw the floor to um, Mariette now and I'll start asking some questions. So Mariette, um, there, there's a question around um, there's a question around um, there being an abundant growth of white clover in paddocks this year. Um, and in some areas, the coverage is around 75% clover to grass. Um, in your experience with horse nutrition, um, can this lead to too much protein ingested by the horses or any other health issues? Um. Yeah, so clover, uh, thanks for that question. And clover is a big issue in temperate climates with heavy rain, you know, with throughout the year, reasonably high rainfall, but particularly around the spring. And there's different types of clover. So you have your clover indeed that uh, that grows very close to the ground. And then you have your clover, that, the red clover that is a little bit more elevated, that has a little bit more stem uh, ratio. With the white clover, which is typically very close to the ground, um, it, uh, it is very palatable to horses because it is a, indeed it's a, leg, it's a legume, so it's legumes have a typical um, plant composition that their leaf material has a higher protein level, like higher in nitrogen level, and compared to, for instance, uh, your grasses. And it's, it's the way they can fix nitrogen and have a very efficient um, uh, photosynthesis, photosynthesis pro process where they can A, um, gain more uh, protein and two, they can um, also store more carbohydrates. So they typically are also higher in what we call the non-structural carbohydrates. So legumes typically have a lot of leaf, not a lot of stem. So that makes them very nutritious for protein um, high in what we call soluble sugars and not so rich in what we call um, structural fibers, which you would see much more in your bunch grasses, which have that elongation and that have that lot of stem. And, and I think most are familiar that as we're getting closer to summer, like with the um, tempered grasses, they lignify and, and the fiber content goes up. But you don't have that as much in your, in your clover. So it stays very very nutritious uh, as it as it persists and as it um, as it can grow under the right conditions and it can go all the way from summer as you may be aware to um, autumn and typically uh, goes dormant in in the in the in the winter but it may still persist in in um, in good conditions um, with that indeed if the horse is exposed to pastures where the cover is say indeed 75%, you are exposing your horses to a very, uh, a very, uh, very high nutritional source. And that can cause problems of um, too much protein. You can even see horses developing um, uh, lumps on their body. Um, they can have digestive problems, so in diarrhea, so there's just too much uh, protein and uh, that can cause a disturbance in the microorganisms, can lead to um, can lead to diarrhea. And then the big one that I think most people are quite aware with is if you have quite a very sugary type of plant, it can potentially lead to insulin related issues, which may then trigger uh, laminitis. Uh, thanks for that, um, Marriott. So you're, you're, you're saying that that percentage in the paddocks is too much. You should um, try and vary there 
um, their palate more? Ideally, yes. Obviously, um, ideally in a system with grazing animals, um, they are designed to eat a variety of, uh, of vegetation and anything that is particular a monoculture, you're offering only one nutrition or one nutritional profile to a grazing animal. It is almost similar that I'm giving you everyday pizza. So you will get some nutritional deficiencies or you can get, you know, obviously metabolic related issues. So we want to typically avoid these monocultures, but it's a monoculture of, every, you know, of any type, like even, even your roads or you want to kind of have a mixture of grasses um, that you like to have in your paddock, um, which can create different niches, but it also attracts different microorganisms that, you know, that all work in a in a very uh, symbiotic uh, relationship. And if you have only one, it typically can create um, much more issues with uh, with diseases, with bacteria, with nematodes that are, you know, that that thrive uh, on those types of plants. So. Um, there's multiple reasons why you want to have variety. A, for the animal. Two, for uh, a healthy ecosystem that can cope with uh, more disease prevention, with more disease uh, uh, pests. Okay. Okay. Um, so, and so we've got it. Um, Ron has put in a question around, we have over 15 species of grass, legumes and herbs in our pasture. Do we really need to feed supplements? Supplementation for animals is on a case by case basis and really depends on a few factors. First, indeed, the nutritional requirements of the horse. So you will have to always first go back. Well, what are the, the requirements of my horse? Is the horse um, an older horse? Is it a young horse? Is it working? Is it exercising? And you have to apply a really honest, um, you know, an honest evaluation on that because I often horse owners overestimate how much exercise the horse actually does. Um, typically leads them to overfeeding and a wastage of feeding, for instance, supplements. So always start with the nutritional requirements of your horse. Have a look at what it needs. Then too is what is the horse designed to to eat and obviously it's a it's a herbivore it's typically um, mainly large part is um, normal ratio is around 90 percent grazing 10 percent browsing but we've seen in nature that that can fluctuate from 50 per 50 to indeed um, 90 or even fully 100 percent grazing so they can eat a variety of both um, what we call like your woody species as well as your grass grasses then if ideally in a system where if you're not doing much work or the horse is not in a high level type of exercise, pasture uh, and or hay could be the only thing that you need, maybe with the addition of few supplements. And that is in relation to some of the deficiency or some of the problems that you may have with pastures. So for instance, um, if your horse, uh, if you are um, in a tropical system, we may have, for instance, um, plants with high, high, um, high amounts of secondary compounds that can cause deficiency. I think the big head, so the calcium deficiency is a, is a very typical one. Um, it can also be created by uh, not only grasses, but also by legumes like soursop is a very common one in, um, in, uh, in South Australia that can cause also um, uh, uh, hypocalcemia in horses and that means that you may have to still uh, feed a supplement such as um, calcium and salt and magnesium to a horse to make sure that it gets still the requirements and building blocks for like uh, you know for general health bone keeping bone health and so again on a case-by-case -case basis you want to kind of consider what you may want to add so supplements still even with a really good pastoral system is still very uh, useful for instance salt is probably the the major one so having a salt block or um, feeding horses a little bit of salt with um, with in indeed a, a few other components um, would probably still be, be part of of any management of horses right that, that explains a lot. Thanks. Um, um, Audra 
has asked a question. During summer, is it worth pulverising manure and putting it down in paddocks, especially before rain? Yeah, so uh, as mentioned in the presentation, so ideally if, um, if you have the time and you have an interest, composting is probably the best thing that you can do because you um, create a better composition of ingredients and um, and 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 um, a media that you can put to the soil and as I said it helps you with fast tracking uh, some of the other systems to to help you with for instance decomp um, decompacting um, growing certain type of species of grass um, if you can't do that still you know spreading manure and um, spreading that in certain areas and applying maybe like a mulch or like your old hay on top is another way to um, to um, to to um, kind of do like a, um, a, a, a maybe an easier way of composting because you're still adding your organic component there, you still have your nitrogen component there, but it's very important that you don't, um, yeah, that you don't uh, do this during the dry, that it just sits there. You want to have water so that it kind of decays and also you don't want to have your horses in those areas. So yes, it's very useful still to use manure, but I would always try and do that with either A, harrowing it in with uh, before the rain, or two, do it with a mulching. Yeah. Okay. Um, sounds good. Leanne Kane has put a question in around where can I get more information on manure management and composting correctly? Well, we um, we are um, uh, we have quite a few articles that I have written for for horse magazines. Um, I have also on my website uh, a bit of information about soil and composting. Um, so uh, the links will be provided um, when we send the email out. I can um, I can give uh, again overview of some of the resources of my website and also the the social media. So as I uh, show, we have a Facebook page. Um, been so busy that I'm not always super active with it. Um, but we we continuously try to publish a lot on this and we also host quite a few uh, webinars on it. So we have um, uh, soon uh, a new one up upcoming in, in your area. So um, if you go to, um, yeah, if you connect with us on on, uh, on Facebook, there's actually already some some up about the uh, upcoming workshops that I do for, you know, for a variety of land care organizations uh, around Australia, but we have one in Victoria upcoming for this one. Um, there is, um, there's just some other information, uh, on, on the, if, if everyone has a look at the, the Q&A, there's some other information there around, there's Marriott's website up there, um, there's some information there about Melbourne Water providing, um, grants to people who do works on their properties, um, projects that, um, can, that help protect the soil and surface runoff. So it's a really great way to um, get some funding for your projects. Um, the other question that I'd like to pose to you, Marriott, is what's your advice to repair pugged soil in paddocks which become hard as the weather dries out and dries the soil? Yeah. And is that is that soil with grass cover or a very limited? Uh, a bit of grass cover. Yep. Yeah, so one of uh, what we're now seeing is obviously we had a bit of rain and now we're having those hot temperatures again and, and the soil is probably still quite stressed from last from the last years of drought or at least uh, in my area and in, in the tablelands of New South Wales. Um, we had a, a bit of rain but it's now drying out and so Irrigation would be ideal to be able to continuously supply water to your areas and um, but obviously water is precious and not everybody would be having a water source that you know water source that they can draw on and um, so that can only be done uh, potentially with uh, the light also with a license so it depends a little bit if you are connected to a waterway and if you have um, a license and how much you can draw of that. Um, the other, the other thing that uh, that again is very important for these type of, um, you know, to avoid this kind of drying out is again making sure that you have ground cover or mulch. So mulching, 
slashing paddocks. So slashing paddocks, having mulch there, making sure that any moisture that is getting on there is kind of captured. Um, again, manure, adding manure, um, having uh, that dew and that moisture, like that mulching in the morning will be enough to keep the soil still a bit conditioned. So I would say um, I, irrigation, if possible, to keep, um, keep, uh, keep the system going over summer. Uh, and then it can be a low pressure, uh, like a pop system that often I advise for, for horse owners. They typically have low water, um, but that helps just to uh, ensure that there is still a little bit of water going onto uh, some of the areas that you develop because it's nothing frustrating. Then you start your development, you're doing maybe like an aeration and then sowing in, you know, doing a non tillage sowing and then um, not having you know the water coming through to you know after one rain to kind of kick start and make sure that it's established so and then i think for those that don't have that option i think come back to the principles of mulching making sure that you uh, cover the ground and that you keep any dew or any any uh, condensation that happens um, uh, in in your in in that kind of top layer with your mulch, so that it it feeds back into your soil and conditions it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another um, another comment made by Audra. Um, the the Nestle webinar next month on composting with Mariette. I think yes. she's put that in as a comment. Yeah. Yes, we can provide a link to that as well in in the email. Um, yeah. Okay, sounds good. And we um, some newsletters. Um, we've been doing a few newsletters as well, and I think uh, we've just done. Um, we just did actually just uh, part on uh, on the co on um, repairing damaged soils, typically focusing on compaction. So I talk a little bit more there about um, deep ripping, uh, deep ripping using key lining or like an aerator. So uh, that's up, and I think um, for the next. Um, news article that uh, that we want to publish in December. Uh, we will uh, provide a little bit more uh, detail around the rain garden. So all the details I just presented will be in there um, for as reference. So you can read it again in um, and and keep that uh, keep that as a reference if you are keen to endeavor on that um, on that uh, um, on that project on the project. Okay. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. Um, all right, well, I might wrap up there if no one else has got any further questions for Mariette. Um, and I might pass over to Bronwyn. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. And thank you, Mariette, for your, for your answers um, on some of those curly questions.